As you come up to the microphone, uh, please identify yourself and uh, where you come from. May I? No. Yes. Hi, my name is Stephen Pryor. I serve as Deputy Mayor in Newark, New Jersey. Um, I actually just returned this morning from Haiti um, with a, uh, a group that uh, joined the International Rescue Committee working on economic recovery um, in Port-au-Prince. Um, in my previous life, uh, was a co-founder of the schools that became the Achievement First Network of Charter Schools in Connecticut and New York. Um, so I wanted to direct a question to the minister, if I may, Mr. Minister. Um, I had the opportunity this past week being in Haiti to visit uh, the Dabon community. Um, and in Dabon, there is a uh, privately run free school um, that is like many, many schools in Haiti uh, struggling to get back on its feet. The facility was crushed. Um, there is a tent that's been established in anticipation of schooling. Um, I salute you, Mr. Minister, for all of the efforts that are underway in the midst of this turmoil. Um, there seemed to be a question in Dabon and uh, in other places that we traveled around the school system as to what the proposed timeline would be for the immediate reopening um, and then for the phasing in over the longer term. Um, and I know uh, full well from having started these schools in Connecticut and New York that uh, time pressures um, and uh, substantive goals sometimes are at odds. But would you be able, Mr. Minister, to share a preliminary timeline that you expect for the reopening of schools and then for other reforms? Merci, Monsieur le Maire. If I fully understood your question, I certainly understood that you went to Haiti, you went to Dabon, next to Leogan. This is a small town or village which is not far from Port-au-Prince, 25 kilometers from the capital, and that was terrifically damaged, hard hit, because it was closer to the epicenter on the 12th of January. Well, in point of fact, there is a lot of goodwill, but I would also like to say that when you speak about not non-public schools that perhaps offer almost free services, this is also to speak a bit about the Haitian educational system. We talk about well, we have public and non-public schools because they're not public non-public schools. There are uh, private schools. We've got church schools, NGO-run school, schools, a host of different kinds of schools, profit-making and not profit-making. We're talking about non-public schools. You spoke about a timeline now, and you asked about a timeline, and I must say that for the moment, we are micro-planning to check and verify the state of play of, the, of each school, because the problem of the schools, when we talk about schools, we're talking about big schools that have a lot of space. They had a lot of standard infrastructure, but there are also other schools that can fit into a small uh, his store. Uh, some were housed in uh, a private home, for example. There's no space. So we're trying to look at a grouping of schools. And when we talk about 4,000 schools that were destroyed in the West, we are not going to have 4,000 new locations. We don't have any possibility to do that for the 4,000 uh, sites, as it were, don't have the intake capacity. So we're thinking about a strategy of regrouping the schools and school sites or locations. There were big schools that had a lot of space. Those have to now house four morning schools or other schools based on the prefab structures and in the afternoon then house four other new schools so that in the same space you can uh, house eight schools, double uh, uh, space use. In other words, with 3,000 uh, regrouped schools, you can house the entire population to take in the entire school population. So these are the kinds of strategies that we've got underway. But as I say, we have to do a lot of micro-planning, as I was saying. We are well aware of the reality, but just the fact of having to demolish and to clean up everything, that is a huge Herculean task. 
And if we're going to engage in that task, well, that's one of the things that will uh, risk losing the school year for the children. So we're talking about regrouping activities. But at any rate, for myself, there is a first deadline. There is a first deadline, and that is the first or the second of April. And of course, there are schools that are now uh, picking up just for the morning. But in Haiti, when we talk about schools, we're talking about private schools, and there are those that are others in Pétionville, and this area was not really a uh, hit per se. It means that the physical uh, presence is intact, but the risk or the danger, I've always been prudent. I don't want to speak about relaunching schools, because of course there are some schools that can take in the children, but as I was saying, we've got an evacuation uh, problem. In the buildings that we exist, we didn't always have uh, buildings that were constructed for schools. Private homes were transformed into schools. So uh, with the earthquake now, there might uh, there might be earthquakes again. Uh, we're talking about uh, evacuation means it could lead to uh, other problems as well. But as of when we give the green light and open things up, there are some individuals, perhaps which who are less responsible, who are in the uh, lower income areas, if we want to relaunch areas to take these children into non-secure buildings rather than to, or I should say, to look for aid from NGOs and say that we want aid. That's why we're concentrating our efforts. Between now and the end of March, we hope to have a critical mass of space and mobilize a critical mass of schools to be able to take in as many children as possible. We don't want to uh, fool ourselves. The relaunch is going to be done slowly but surely. We cannot really kick off in April everything, but by the middle of May, let's just say that there are some possibilities of tweaking the timeline that will allow us to take in the children so that we can have a school year by the end of August because the strategy cannot compromise the school year. By the first week of October into next year, we have to be able to relaunch the school year. And as I was saying, there has to be tweaking of the curriculum, which will allow us to save the year, even if we kick off in mid-May. We were saying with about 80 uh, classrooms that can be used, we were talking about the efficient uh, use of space for the school year and accelerated uh, school year to uh, save the essential. We also have to note that there are migrant students, those who have left Port-au-Prince and have gone to other uh, departments, as it were, and we've got strategies there to take them in as well. Now, I should speak about a three-tiered strategy. First, we're taking on and using the infrastructure that already exists. We've got uh, space and schools that exist. We can use them. We're trying to recuperate a school space that were free in the afternoon for taking in children. And then thirdly, we are ready to set up uh, these uh, temporary schools to take in the other categories. So this is a way of taking on all the children, taking them all on board. But we've got 500,000 children outside or who are not in school. We've got the Education for All uh, program from the past. But now, in the next three to four months, in the next six months, we really are going to have to have and across the board planning to ensure that as of next year, as of October, all children can go back to school. And there, Mr. Gomez spoke about a challenge. Well, there's another challenge be to guarantee going back to school and uh, taking in the three million that are already in school is one thing, but to make things available to take in the 500,000 others. And when we talk about these 100,000, we're talking about six, seven, eight years that uh, of people who have gone beyond the normal school age and who are functional uh, literates. They get the, the least possible in terms of reading and writing, but for vocational training, we'd like to put them there so they can quickly uh, get back on stream and earn a living. Okay. Uh, let's go to this over mic, to this mic over here, please. Good morning. My name is Tracy Washington. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I run a uh, help run 
a nonprofit called Louisiana Justice Institute, um, whose mission is to foster and support social justice campaigns throughout Louisiana. And most recently, we have been involved and partnered with um, the Louisiana Disaster Recovery Foundation, an organization formed after Hurricane Katrina, to co-direct and co-form um, Louisiana Haiti Sustainable Village Project. And we are on ground now building structures and working in um, Jacmel. And I, I come with a question and a comment um, for the Minister of Education and maybe um, um, Paul Vallis, who I've worked with quite frequently, and, and um, Ms. Wegdahl can, can, call, can, can comment on. I think now, and the reason so many people in New Orleans have, have become so involved and engaged in the rebuilding and efforts in Haiti is because post-Hurricane Katrina, so many things went wrong in the rebuilding of the Gulf Coast. And one of the things we found now, five years later, as we re-examine what's happened over the last five years, that um, most people have found themselves in the most upset about, is the lack of community engagement initially in all aspects of rebuilding. And before Paul got to New Orleans, which was 2007, I believe, Paul, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of those most affected areas was in education. We fired all of our teachers post Hurricane Katrina um, and had to, sue, had to sue over that. We refused to open our school buildings even though we had kids in the street and I had to sue. We had to sue to reopen our schools. And I think so much of that and so many of those issues around education in particular could have been resolved and worked out um, with strategic planning and framework that engaged the community from the beginning. And so I'd ask the minister and the panelists to comment on this community, in, uh, on this civic engagement and the importance of this community engagement in the recasting and rebuilding of sustainable education systems that can be used as community hubs for adult education for the dispensing of health care. Um, we know from New Orleans, mental health of our children has been critical. And, and when we don't deal with that, how, what, what problems come? And I run a school, and I run a charter school, and so I know these, some of these things from just that. And so if you guys could comment, particularly on the community engagement. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Well, I, I can respond. One of the reasons that I was recruited down to New Orleans was because of the very rough and tumultuous first year so uh, as Tracy will point out so uh, uh, they you know they barely got schools open that first year of course you know and now the last three years we've we have uh, we probably have more schools than we need and uh, more teachers than we can recruit also let me point out that uh, in three years we've been there uh, we, we have a, a terrific relationship with the teachers union no lawsuits against us at least not on my watch all against the previous school board which fired all the teachers but uh, but the bottom line is I think one of the reasons and there have been a number of surveys that have been done in New Orleans that talk about uh, uh, Tulane University for example 84 percent of the parents like the reforms at 80 percent plus like the charter schools like the school choice because New Orleans is hundred percent choice it's hundred percent site selection meaning Hiring decisions and promotions are based on performance and qualifications. 74% uh, of the parents believe that school choice is accessible. Uh, part of the key to this, uh, I believe, has been the fact that uh, the community now feels more involved and engaged. There's always going to be some entrenched individuals who want to go back to the old days, uh, and some people out of New Orleans who don't want accountability for the rest of the state because the recovery school district takes over failing schools throughout the state. Uh, but uh, but uh, the fact that all of our schools have local, uh, all of our charter schools, which c comprise the majority of our schools, have local governing councils, and all of the remaining direct run schools also have their own local advisory boards with an option of converting to charters, I think the community feels a much greater sense of engagement than that critical first and second year when individuals like Tracy had a, actually had a demand that schools be open or, or schools be made accessible. So I think community involvement is, is absolutely a key. You know, I think in the articulation, 
uh, 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 about the uh, uh, tsunami intervention, uh, the fact that you created a task force that had a community nexus, that local governments and local community groups, or the sectors you refer to, were a big part of the planning. I, I think that goes a long way. And, and the creation of, of any sort of recovery authority through the Ministry of Education to open schools and to improve schools and to ultimately have a long-term plan uh, to uh, provide for a quality publicly funded educational system, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, has, to have, has to have a community nexus. It, it can't be something from the outside coming in. It has, to, it has to have local control. It has to have local leadership. It has to have local governments. It, it has to have a local engagement. So critical. Thank you. Monsieur le Ministre. Oui, oui. Et je peux compléter, justement. Yes, thank you very much. I can flesh Merci. things out and complete Et a reply. Thank you very much. I took due note of the comments made by our colleague from New Orleans, and particularly she apprised us of some of the shortcomings that took place in New Orleans. I particularly paid attention to the fact that there was a relaunching of school activities a few months after the first schools were reopened about four months after, and there was a kind of mobilization of the teachers. Now, we understood and got the information, and we are now taking advantage of that information because we told ourselves that we really have to pick up things very quickly because first, it's the school that's going to normalize life in Haiti and the school is a good driving force of Haitian economy. We have about 80,000 teachers and their life worries us as well. When we have a per high percentage of private schools, in other words, the salaries are not guaranteed. So that in terms of mobilizing some of the actors and involving the state players, or the stakeholders, I should say, in the analysis process of relaunching the schools, I have grouped together all the stakeholders, representative of Protestant schools, the uh, teachers' unions, the consortia of private education players or actors, and so on and so forth. We have discussed getting together to discuss their common causes and their concerns to be able to get activities up and going again. But we particularly noted that there is the risk of demobilizing the teachers because the biggest schools can pay the teachers as of January, and they were told that for the rest of the time, we don't know anything, we don't have any control of the situation, and we are just waiting for, for, for the state. So that this has basically demobilized the teachers. The teachers who got a pittance in the private uh, sector, about 100,000 uh, Haitian Gouda, which is the equivalent per month of about, I would say, 150 uh, US dollars maximum per month. So I really don't think I'm mistaken about that. It's about that, 150 US per month. So that's just to give you an overview. And that's why we're talking about relaunching school activities to avoid any demobilization of the teachers, any stepping down so that the teachers can continue to receive their salary because these teachers are a, a driving force and these teachers at the same time back at work can stimulate the economy to a certain extent. Now, you also spoke about engagement of all the stakeholders in Haiti. Let me just tell you, Article 32.2 of the Constitution makes education uh, uh, the responsibility of the state and others. The competence of local actors, the mayor, is already enshrined in the Haitian Constitution. Their involvement is enshrined. But this involvement has not always been well defined to the point where there are uh, shortcomings, there are mayors who close down schools in their communities because they feel that they're not quite ready to get things up and going again, or they are discouraged in terms of the evaluation of the schools in their system or their area. But 
there is a, a, a demand, as it were. So in this regard, with a lot of the mayor's offices, we've talked to them. We are trying to uh, have a census of the migrants and to get a common understanding so that we can get these children back in school. But I totally agree. When we talk about rebuilding the educational system, we're talking about better involvement of the local communities. There were so many shortcomings in terms of regulation, but we now truly believe that reinvolvement of the mayors can redefine the situation and can reduce the wastage that took place even with the public schools. So along that line, then, I would like to say that there is some attention being paid in terms of the strategic plan for re-founding uh, or rebuilding the education system, and particularly when we talk about uh, avoiding demobilization of teachers, as it were. Let me just give you an example. The state is well aware of the fragility of the precariousness of the situation. Let me just give you an example. The FTI funds the initiative for accelerated implementation of educational programs which was made available by the donors well before the 12th of January, but which had not yet been used, I personally asked for these funds to almost 100% feed into a compensation fund for the non-public school teachers and for the funds go to support the non-public schools or be totally available to compensate for the salaries of the non-public school teachers. And with other IDB donors, there have been proposals put that deal with the concern, and that is a part that will be used for furniture, uh, for structures, but other parts of the monies have to be used for compensating the teachers because this demobilization or possible demobilization means that we've said if the teachers step down, it'll be the end of the schools, and if the schools uh, end, as it were, it'll be the end of the Haitian society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, question over here. Please keep sure. your questions short and to the point. Sure. Uh, my name is Daniel Lamoud. I'm a Haitian American. I'm concerned with the development of Haiti. Uh, my question is to the Minister of um, Education. Um, if you had to ask the international community, the international donors, for specific aid for the Haiti education system, what numbers would you put on that specific aid? Do you have those numbers yet in terms of dollars uh, that are needed? And uh, also, where would that aid, uh, how would that aid be funneled? Would it be go to the government? to the NGOs, to the private sector, uh, and the transparency issues. Uh, how, do, how does the donor community know that, um, the, how, that the aid actually is going to be well, 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 well used? And lastly, uh, how, what sort of plans can you put to forth to show to the international community that uh, Haiti will win itself out from these donor uh, supported uh, 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 educational uh, support uh, for, the f for the first few years. Merci. Thank you very much. Well, there are evaluation efforts that are currently being done in terms of UNDP and the other post-disaster needs assessment programs, evaluation of post-disaster needs. There are efforts being made to tally things up for rebuilding Haiti in general. Now, as far as concerns the educational system as well, there are other uh, efforts by the IDB, for example, that is now putting some proposals. They have made some progress. For example, we have to have about $2 million for the educational system. We are now completing our strategic plan and the figure court term to midterm, but there I understand that it should be about $2 billion. We're talking about billion because we're talking about short term, but if you do it based on temporary uh, situation and based on what I said, uh, supplies, uh, compensation for non-public things, and hot meals and the psychosocial assistance that is necessary. Basically, we have to talk about rebuilding, reconstructing the educational system, a system which is not public by about 80%. So we're going to have to come up with a strategy 
And for quite some time now, I've been saying that the private-public dichotomy school system doesn't really exist anymore under my watch. We have to simply get the kids in school and to create the environment for them so that education is done in good conditions and so that we have a quality-oriented education. Now, when we have a contractual agreement and we are in a position to put together something with the private elements, private elements up and running, then we're talking about rebuilding. But when you're talking about emergency or urgency, we're talking about rebuilding the educational system, the physical rebuilding as well. Because I really don't know if Mr. Vanas or was Mr. Gomez that spoke about it a minute ago, but it's not the physical environment only that we're dealing with. We're talking about the buildings, yes, for schools, but we also, and the First Lady spoke about other uh, uh, schools, uh, outside schools, uh, uh, under trees and so on, so we know that the physical environment counts as well in terms of the quality. So when we talk about reconstruction funds, well, after the earthquake, we really are going to have to rebuild the schools based on new standards, based on uh, uh, para-seismic uh, 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 standards so that we don't have the same situation that we found ourselves in on the 12th of January. Now, we're talking about coordination. For the moment, there are discussions underway to implement trust funds, as was the case in uh, uh, post-Katrina. We think that that could be a good solution in terms of what we have in mind, a fund that is going to be managed for, uh, based on known procedures with donors. We think that that could be a very good solution. And for us, in that vein, the Haitian government also has to provide the guidelines in terms of the objectives. But I can tell you that the management, the daily management of the funds doesn't interest us. Once the funds are set up personally after the 12th of January, I spoke with the donors, and I really didn't have anybody in particular, but I wasn't concerned with that. What we're interested in are the objectives. I really want to know how I can get the children back to school. For these prefab schools that I have, I have to define the actual space, but I'm talking about getting kids back to school. I'm really not interested in the management of these trust funds. Uh, yes, there are weaknesses, there are shortcomings in terms of uh, uh, managing these funds after the 12th of January. The ministry was destroyed, after all. But what it, I'm trying to tell you is that we have uh, accompanied uh, the donors, we've discussed rules, but we haven't talked about directly managing these trust funds. What we have to do is get the transparency system up and running, and I think that that is in the hands of the state. And I can tell you that I've been, I'm also in the government, and aid has not been spoken of per se but it's not directly uh, attached to the government. Yes, there are coordination problems, but perhaps we'll have a chance to talk about that. That was the case in Indonesia, as far as I understand, but in point of fact, yes, there are some aid coordination problems. The donors, the state, have to sit down together, and we have to find the best modus operandi. There has to be better coordination of the aid, but based on transparency, I think that trust funds, based on the procedures established and managed by the entities that are accepted by everyone, I would say that that would be the best mechanism to have transparency. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Monsieur le Ministre. Uh, we'll go over this. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Rogina Chanwan. I'm actually at the Inter-American Development Bank. And I'm originally from Haiti, so I will be asking my question in French. Uh, Monsieur le Ministre, cette question est pour vous. Minister, I have a question for you. Well, as a Haitian with experience in the educational system, you spoke about your short-term plans. How are you going to get those short-term plans up and running? How are you going to get them going? Secondly, I'd like to know, you spoke about the quality of education. I'd like to know to be able to find the teachers. Where are you going to find the teachers who can help the children to overcome this terrible disaster? And you also spoke about rebuilding, reconstruction. I would talk about a building of the Haitian uh, s educational system. What are your short-term plans, actually? Thank you very much. Well, you're talking about the short term. You're saying, what are we going to do? What's the plan? We've got a plan in place already. It's ready. It's already written. 
perhaps it haven't been co-financed, but I would like to specify and clarify here that there was a big wave of solidarity since the 12th of January. And that has been throughout the entire world through civil society via states, but also uh, different organizations. So we're having a hard time actually crystallizing all of this and having firm commitments. But I would like to tell you, for the moment, there's a lot of mobilization. There is a big wave of mobilization. I have to uh, salute the donors and the uh, cooperation organizations. We are quite well supported be it from the World Bank and so on and so forth, but there is no shadow of a doubt that the challenges are tremendous. We did try, we have tried to, to uh, get the figures for the short term, but we have to really get a, a balance, uh, an overview of everything has to be done. Well, that should go beyond $100,000. We're talking about the short term for the next six months. We don't talk about $2 billion, passing $2 billion, actually. But just to tell you that we're talking about astronomical figures for Haiti, and you can understand that no one will talk to you about the absorption capacity. Now, it's true that there are shortcomings in terms of the administrative backdrop. But you spoke about the quality of education to find the right teachers. Now, we've been saying that, in point of fact, there are a lot of shortcomings there as well. We're talking about less than 30% that are qualified. There are more than 100,000 that are out of the system, but also with the strategy we have today, we are talking about getting the schools in the departments and the ones outside of the big cities and dealing with the supply and demand and the uh, influx from the rural areas, the provinces. We've got a lot of problems. Perhaps we have to recruit non-teachers, as Mr. Vanas was saying. People who aren't teachers appeal to young university students who are available and give them some basic training so that they can be also pulled in into the classrooms. The universities are decapitalized today. Uh, that's a weakness as well because there are universities, the biggest universities in Haiti where there's only a physical space. All of the buildings have been destroyed. So in that regard, universities are opened for the services of those people. But to place the students, uh, they can be in social services or teaching so that these students can pay their fees and then allow the universities to kick off again. Now, there's a host of strategies to improve qualifications for teachers. This year alone, with the help of the World Bank, we launched what was called initial training, accelerated initial training. Instead of waiting for teachers to spend three years in a uh, teacher training school, we actually got up and running a nine-month teacher training program where the teacher will have the basic uh, information and will uh, follow some training under the state. But after nine months, then the teacher can actually get into a classroom. But by and large, there is a, a basket of available resources. We still have some uh, uh, teachers who are alive, university students, and there are even continuous education strategies that will allow students, uh, excuse me, allow teachers to go where they have to. But it also takes training, continuous education, programs and proper training for the teachers. We're talking about short term, medium term, and long term. But in that regard, there is a plan that has to lead to the certification for teachers so that they can be followed for the level that they have to be qualified on as teachers. We really just have to get these systems back up and running. That's what it's all about. Uh, I was just going to make one comment. Uh, you know, what's going to be critical, because in, in many of the underdeveloped countries, the development of these private educational systems are, are really driven by economics. It's not necessarily driven by a, an embrace of, of education. Uh, and, and in many of these entities, it, this is a livelihood. Uh, what's going to be critical over the short term is, is that uh, public funds are made available to actually compensate teachers. Uh, if you do that, I mean, there are so many people unemployed, so many people have been dislocated, so many people are barely 
surviving if you do that you know people will gravitate back to the educational profession if you you know this becomes an economic development mechanism for 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 stimulating uh, you know a reopening of the schools so twofold one is publicly funding uh, all your schools, uh, private, paying for the teacher's salaries, would get teachers back into school, would gravitate, would get people uh, to actually come in and to offer to teach in school, would certainly give an opportunity to employ many of these university students who have been dislocated, particularly if you give them an added incentive of giving them a credit, a uh, college credit for, for which many uh, universities do, you get credit for doing your student teaching. Uh, once you have them in that publicly funded system, even if they are in private schools or parochial schools, you can then, over a period of time, begin to demand more of them. You can then demand professional development. Uh, the national curriculum, if upgraded and improved, can then you can then demand that they begin to use the national curriculum. So by you know you provide that economic incentive to bring uh, teachers back to the system and to encourage people. Uh, who have the educational, minimal educational skills to enter into the system, and then through that process over a gradual period, you begin to improve the quality of those individuals. But clearly, the most critical thing is, is for the country to secure enough dollars so that they can, in effect, finance these teachers, because some of these schools, and not only have these schools been uh, destroyed in these, and you know, parents can't pay for the public education, the private education now. I mean, they're without livelihoods. So clearly, making it public by paying the teachers is a way to not only get the teachers to come back, but to recruit new teachers. But now you've got that hold. Now you can begin over a period of time to improve their quality and to demand more of them in return for the subsidy. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're running short of time. We have time for uh, maybe two or three more questions. There will be time to speak with the panelists <laughs> afterwards. Uh, we still have our coffee outside, our coffee tables. Uh, so uh, we will go now with uh, this person who wants to ask a question. Good morning. My name is Michael Drebel. I'm an education specialist at the, at the World Bank. I had two questions, but then I'm going to limit to one. My question was for Christine Wedekul and the, uh, uh, His Excellency, the Education Minister. We had in Haiti, before the earthquake, already many donors uh, in the field, in education. We already had some coordination structure between the donors and the government. Um, Haiti, as mentioned by this Excellency, the Education Minister, is already a partner of the Education for All Fast Track Initiatives. Uh, and a multi-donor trust fund has already been set up. Now, after the earthquake, we've seen many donors, uh, many NGOs, many actors coming in Haiti providing emergency education relief. Many of those that had no experience sometimes of Haiti or the background, um, even of the education national strategy. And it seems that it's very difficult to integrate those new actors that are very much needed at the same time to make sure that they understand that although there's been a lot of destruction, they have to, uh, they're coming in, in a, into a context with things that have been done and we want to make sure that we can use this new support you know, in the most cost-effective way. So my question would be really, what recommendation based on the uh, experience of Aceh in the, Indonesia you have for, for all of us who work in Haiti? And, and the question for the education minister based on that is that what does he see the role of the uh, education ministry to, to provide this, this leadership and this coordination? Thank you. I would say that uh, I, I was talking about the different sector tables or cluster groups. I think it's extremely important that you do do have meetings uh, as you know weekly meetings or even more to discuss who is doing what uh, and do the mapping within the within the sector groups because if you do that, then also the the really small ones that are how would I put it maybe if you it, it's good, but it's not, I mean, it's, um, you would kind of uh, silt out the, the ones that are not as important. And you will feel with, with this kind of meetings, you will, you will see who is doing what to the table. So I could just encourage the, the, the sector tables to be up and running as soon as possible and invite people to, to, to be there. Of course, what you said, I mean, there are so many that are coming in and everyone wants to have a, a, a say if you say if you've been one school or if you've been 100 schools. But uh, I think that um, the, 
the, the um, all the, uh, all actors will um, will have to take on responsibility to what I say also to feed into the uh, strategic uh, framework because if you do have a strategic framework then you can also see what uh, what who is doing what okay. so I think um, be practical in that sense and 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 meet as as, uh, as often as possible especially now in this now in between the recovery phase before the reconstruction starts it's really important that uh, these meetings uh, really are set up and are get gets going yes uh, we know that you have the sectoral group for education in uh, Haiti. There is a education forum which works under the UN uh, with the UNICEF and other NGOs. There is sort of a movement towards the mobilization and uh, involvement of all actors. It means that everybody wants to participate, but that's very hard to manage. I recognize it. Uh, I noted the education cluster under UNESCO, which is in Haiti, and I also know what's going to happen while we're waiting to rebuild the Ministry of Education, which was totally destroyed. When I go by the UNESCO office in Port-au-Prince, I understand it's very hard to work. Uh, to me, that cluster used to organize uh, um, interagency meetings, and I've heard people who speak very loudly, and some imagine that that forum is a place where to go to complain only. So sometimes it's hard to have people participate. It's hard to have everybody involved and in taking into account all the opinions and all the points of view. But it's also a good time to train people to understand the point of view of the various actors. What are we supposed to do? Well. Uh, the post-disaster needs assessment is underway. The government is working on it, and all the stakeholders are involved, not only the government, but also civil society, donors are taking part in it. So we are all establishing this rebuilding plan. When we'll all agree on something, it will be easier to work. The Ministry of Education is preparing a strategic plan, which is better articulated. And we worked together with the Presidential Education Committee, which was established some two years ago, which already was uh, seeing what was necessary in the field of education in order to uh, improve on the education system we had even before the earthquake, in order to bring back children to school to have a relevant education system. Of educational system which would be uh, in phase with the reality of the professional world. So we are defining at present a strategic plan. Once the document will be validated by the government, it will be our roadmap. And from that moment on, everybody should get together. So we are preparing the strategic document which is going to define the government's intention, whether from the point of view of uh, support policy for the non-public schools or for the reconstruction of buildings, of school buildings, uh, or for the redesigning of the educational system as a whole. This is what is underway. Thank you. Paul?
I wanted to make a, one comment about all donors, particularly small donors. You leave no donor behind, so to speak. Mm -hmm. the, uh, um, one of the things that was done in New Orleans and has been done in other cities is they've actually created within their administrations like Office of New Schools. And the purpose of those uh, offices is to solicit new school proposals. Uh, you know, when you have people of goodwill coming down, for example, um, uh, one, of the, one of our prominent local athletes who remain unnamed, who became somewhat nationally famous, said, uh, you know, contacted my office and said, we want to do something in Haiti. And I said, why don't you open a school or sponsor a school? Uh, we had the same conversation with George Washington University. If all the universities went in and they sponsored a school, you know, there's celebrities, there's big name people, they're all coming forward, they want to do things. Sponsoring a school in Haiti, building the building, providing the infrastructure, providing the contents is a fraction of the cost that it would take to perhaps, say, sponsor a school in New Orleans. Uh, so, you know, so uh, while obviously you have a more comprehensive strategic plan uh, to improve the district as a whole, and we talked about this, the importance of publicly funding teachers so that you can improve their certifications and broadening the pool of qualified teachers by recruiting among the top, edu the top educated class the best and the brightest and bringing them into the profession, uh, always, you know, as part of your strategic design, uh, soliciting individuals who want to contribute, individual donors in their own way. You pair them up with a school that needs more external support, or you get them to sponsor a school in an area where you need a school. We are constantly assessing and evaluating uh, where we need new schools in New Orleans and where we need to expand school choice and, and school options. So we're always open and we're always soliciting, not only at the local level, but at the state level, new school proposals that are coming before us. So simultaneously, uh, uh, you can set up that mechanism so you're constantly seeding your, your school system with new high quality schools that are emerging and when they come in, the facilities are more superior and the content materials is better and perhaps the teachers are, are better trained and perhaps better compensated. So I just want to point that out that you do not want to lose that opportunity to work with those small individual donors and individuals of goodwill, faith-based organizations, universities, philanthropists, you know, foundations, charities, uh, individuals, celebrities who may want to come in and, and may want to make their contribution. Thank you. And as time has run out, we will just entertain one more question. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the panel's um, advice and opinion on how to best identify uh, local talent, people who are motivated uh, by what's happening in Haiti and would be interested in working uh, with international groups to many of the points that, that have been made and the importance of that. Um, I work for Teach for All which is uh, an, a network of organizations around the world that are, that are doing a lot of what Mr. Vallis has described. Uh, certainly Teach for America is one of those organizations that has been pretty critical in New Orleans. And we've been asked by multiple groups to consider operating in Haiti. Our model only works if there's local leadership that pursues us to wrap around that local leadership and help. And I'm just interested, uh, given the, the magnitude of the crisis, has there been any um, coordinating effort around talent? Uh, not only the donors, but, but folks who are interested around the world and or who are in Haiti, uh, ready to step forward and lead some, some pretty significant initiatives. I can make a comment. Uh, obviously working through the uh, Inter-American de Development Bank, and, I've, uh, and um, I've had numerous conversations with uh, Wendy Kopp and Teach for America, as well as some individuals or part of the broader effort about what Teach for America or Teach for All can do uh, in Haiti. And two things that I've suggested, and I will throw this out because these are conversations we've had, is the first thing, uh, you, know, if, you know, if we think that we're going to be able to recruit teachers internationally to come and to fill teaching positions in Haiti, it's, it's not going to happen for two reasons. One is the compensation will never be nearly, uh, it won't come close to what those same individuals are, are receiving through alternative certification programs in areas like New Orleans where the starting teacher salary is $40,000 a year and things of this nature. Just look at the per capita income and things like that. Secondly, uh, just the volume. You're just not going to recruit those individuals who obviously have the linguistic skills to go down there and to provide that quality. But you can recruit on two levels. The first level, if you're going to recruit internationally, individuals of Haitian descent, for example, who are, who are not uh, challenged in terms of the language, they can come down and they can work 
uh, in the provinces as part of like school leadership teams working with the schools in the outlying area to provide the professional development, to provide the technical support, school improvement teams, to provide the monitoring, provide the training. So you can build an infrastructure to do that by recruiting individuals. And not a day goes by, I, I don't get another, uh, you know, Eleanor Antoine who is, is a Harvard educated from Haiti, her parents are from Haiti, Teach for America and the New Leaders uh, Project in New Orleans. I mean, individuals uh, like of her quality are constantly uh, notifying me regularly uh, about their willingness to go down and to participate. Uh, the second thing though is, is, is for Teach for All to set up a program for recruiting locally and that's why I said, you know, how do you recruit locally you create an alternative certification program that is compatible with the country itself. So you recruit the most educated and you invite them in the educational profession. Now, if you do that and you can compensate them, so they're not dependent on the private schools and private school tuition to compensate them, if these teachers can be compensated independently uh, and so that their compensation is secured, uh, you will recruit. You will recruit among the most educated class individuals who may enter the teaching profession. So in my conversations with Wendy, We've talked about kind of that twofold approach. One is obviously to recruit internationally to bring individuals of Haitian descent in who have extensive education backgrounds to, to, to work on the macro level with coordination, maybe principals of larger schools, school improvement teams, but then to create a local indigenous program that recruit, can recruit among the most educated, the key being being able to compensate them reasonably so that, because then it becomes an economic incentive. I mean, if I'm one of those 30,000 or 35,000 university students that have gotten displaced, I would submit to you that probably the majority of the students have educational, uh, uh, have educational uh, uh, records or have educational backgrounds that, that are probably on par superior to many of the teachers that are teaching in the private schools and, sh and they should be taken advantage of. Thank you very much. Thanks. I would like to uh, offer uh, my gratitude to um, First Lady Elizabeth Preval for uh, coming and, and sharing her, her passionate appeal for assistance for a, a greater um, and a better education system in IT. And I want to thank uh, our, our panelists and uh, Dr. Williams will wrap things up. Okay, well thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, a round of applause for our panelists. Um, I'd like to personally uh, thank the, the minister for his time, his energy, uh, his forthrightness uh, about the uh, issues of education in Haiti. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you uh, for, for participating uh, in this program. Um, I would urge and encourage all of you uh, to continue this effort. This is a long-term process, and it is going to need every single one of us giving of our time, our energy, our money, uh, and our efforts. So once again, on behalf of the Consortium of Universities and the George Washington University, thank you very much for being here.